right, so our first question is, um, in light of the uh, symptoms of possession, are mediums possessed? Because they can tell the future, they have all these different characteristics that, I mean, not all of the characteristics, characteristics of um, possession, but some of them. So what, what would we say about that? I know the Bible has something to say about mediums, but what would you guys say? Ooh, who wants to feel this one? I'll, I'll start. So, so going back to the Spellbook story. Oh, yeah, your family. And if, if I, <laughs> then no, nobody that I know of is a practicing spiritualist now. Uh, I, I would have like wanted to read it because I don't believe it. And, and, and my first response to any medium is, you've got a good business bill. You know, I, I don't, I don't believe that the medium has any real power. I think it's all just. A very well executed. Thank you. So no, not possessed. <laughs> Charlotte. There you go, Charlotte. Anybody want to add anything to that? Well. <laughs> <laughs> well. 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 Okay. Uh, let me just give a little background to this. Uh, I am one of four boys of an Italian American family. I have a brother who's a Roman Catholic priest as well. And I also have another brother and two nieces who went to the talk to the dead. Okay. And um, I asked, them, so would you find out? And there was a couple of things that they uh, shared with me um, that were like very difficult to explain how they would know. That being said, I also believe that um, if we and, and when I say we as Catholics believe that our saints and the holy ones marked with the sign of faith can hear our prayers and intercede with us, pray for us. What's to stop somebody from at least having an understanding of, let's say, what uh, the dead are saying? Um, I don't put any faith into it, and yet at the same time, I think there are some people who might be very sincere on it, and I leave that up to God to decide how it all works out when the time comes. But we all stand in front of it. Okay. There were several questions about uh, the medical aspect of this, and how we can tell the difference between a medical diagnosis of like mental illness or any kind of uh, regular illness um, versus an actual possession. So some of the questions were how many doctors does it take, you know, like how many opinions do you have to get in order to rule it out? Um, what the hope of light bulb? Doctors signed off that there was 
evidence of a complete cure with no medical uh, expert, uh, medical evidence to it. Okay, so when the church approaches these men and women of science, they approach them with a lot of respect, and that respect is returned to us. So you're not going to necessarily have, because it's important to realize that all healthcare professionals want the individual to get better. And if they can help, and after a lot of different studies, how many doctors does it take? It, it's all according what the symptoms are. You know, you can't really expect a GP to understand everything that's going on if it's an emotional or mental illness. You have to really go to the specialist for that. So I, I think we also need to um, maybe back off a little bit thinking that every scientist, every uh, medical professional is ready to debunk people of faith because that's not necessarily the case. Okay, um, and they are the first ones to say, you know, uh, a, a quick example, we had a case in um, at uh, St. Robert's. A young girl was diagnosed with very advanced cancer, very aggressive cancer. Um, she, uh, she had several religious encounters in giving and, and grace and blessing with the Holy Father. She came back. They gave her a very uh, powerful uh, new treatment, and within a week, the parents were called in. The parents were scared to death because everybody was very, <coughs> we need to talk to you about this. And what they had to say is, is, of all the treatments, they've never seen the treatment work this fast and this completely. Now, we do not call this a miracle in the I, I, because it wasn't instantaneous. It wasn't cancer, then no cancer. But we do, but it did have the doctors questioning how did this work so well for this person. And today, after really being told that you do not have that long to live because it was such an aggressive fourth stage, she's now in high school and she's doing well. Thank God. So I think. And, and for the, one more thing, I know a lot of young people sometimes come home from college and they tell their families, and this happens, I, I'm sure, in the Protestant tradition, even in the Jewish tradition, I don't believe in God, I believe in science. Okay. And, and, and parents are usually flabbergasted and, you know, it's like, where did we go wrong and everything. Um, I think it's important to realize, and I love saying this, isn't it like, 13 graders on the group are named after Catholic priests. Jesuits, I think. Jesuits. It would be Jesuits. Um, and the, the father of the Big Bang Theory was a Catholic priest. And the father of genetic studies was a Catholic priest. And the scientific method. And the scientific method. So it, we do not necessarily have to have this animosity. I think like so many things, and this animosity is kind of developed to keep us arguing and not finding the common ground. solution to so many of our problems is 
community. Our problems develop in isolation very often. And when our lives are unexamined by ourselves or by others, it is very easy to, to have these things filter in and to fixate on things. To maintain an active membership in your spiritual community, invite other people in, get them involved, talk to one another about all of these things. Sometimes the thing that you think you are the only person that deals with is something that every third person is doing. And you only find that out. You know, our European ancestors, and not just in Europe, I think in Central and South America, had this wonderful appreciation for blessing their children. And I think we sometimes forget that as parents and grandparents, you can bless your children. For us Catholics, everybody thinks you got to have a Roman father to give a blessing. And granted, the blessing, if you're going to bless the car, if you're going to bless the house, Bless it yourself, but you know it's like. But it really counts if, it, if it's a priest. But parents and grandparents, and especially those who are planning on becoming parents, you know, start early by just putting a little sign of the cross on the forehead of your children before they go to bed. And you don't have to say anything except "May God bless you." And a little sign of the forehead. Now, will that? prevent anything as they grow older, no, but you know what? It, it's reminding them who they believe in. And I remember being at a conference where a mom was giving the presentation and she talked about how she blessed her children every night. And as her children became um, high school students, and, you know, she said, I blessed every part of their body sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. She said, but I got that cross in there somehow. Okay, until he was ready to go away to college. And then before he left, he walked over to his mother and he bent his head. And she gave him a blessing. Okay. As I said before, the holy name of Jesus is very powerful for us as Christians to dispel the darkness. Whether that darkness is evil or uh, devil possession or just the darkness of sin. And that, for us, also, the power of that name is connected very much with the sign of the cross. It's just a little cross over here to remind them who they belong to and who will protect them. I'm just going to throw this out there. The USCCB has this handy little prayers against the powers of darkness book that I asked for for my birthday because um, I liked it. It's small and it was cheap and I could carry it around. But it's got a lot of um, little prayers. I'm not worried about becoming demonically possessed. That is the farthest we've come. <laughs> 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 However, there is a heck of a lot of darkness on this world. And you know, I can feel depressed, I can feel hopeless, I can feel angry, I can feel sad, 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 I can feel angry, I can feel afraid or anxious. You know, I have a chronically sick kid, so I can go very, you know, dark in my mind, worrying about him. And actually, um, when I was waiting for the results of the test one day, I was starting to lose it, and I had this in my purse, and I just pulled it out. I couldn't think of any way to calm myself down or any words to say to God, so I just used what was in here because these words were great, you know, and they reminded me of who I am. One of them is all about remembering that I am a child of the light, so that darkness does not belong to me, and I don't belong to it. And so having an active prayer life, you don't have to use this book, but this is just handy for me. It's helpful for me, so I keep it right here, right under my pen. Um, but uh, I think having an active prayer life and making sure that we're in constant communication with God is important. And also remembering that um, it's not a, an equal relationship. The devil is not the same authority or the same power as God. It's God and it's the devil. He's not even close in power. So remembering who's stronger and remembering who you belong to is uh, crucial in keeping the darkness away. Well, one quick point I just want to add. The question was, you know, how can I protect myself? But I think it's imperative that we continue to look out for each other. We can't always do it on our own. And so as Christians, that we always be looking out for, you know, who might just we need some attention from us, who can we just check on. Uh, because even if we try all our might, you know, life hits us hard sometimes, and it's just, if you don't have the strength to do it,
Creek style. So we need to continually look out and see uh, like we can help, how we can help protect others going on in that operation. Okay. And John, anything else you want to jump in on? Yeah, I think at this point, no, I'm good. Right. Oh, wait, actually, no, I do have one. Uh, <clears throat> the only book on exorcism I have, a friend of mine purchased at a truck stop in Tennessee. It is probably not authoritative. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, how do you discern speaking in tongues from demonic possession causing someone to speak in different languages? And I think this is kind of a deeper question, too, that's, you know, one symptom is the speaking there are a lot of different things. I was talking to a group about, you know, some people have those you know, twitches and, and ticks. You know, there are um, people who cut themselves but aren't necessarily, you know, possessed. Um, so just the symptoms in general. I mean, speaking in tongues is a good one, but the symptoms in general, how can we tell the difference between this just being a thing and this being a possession? Well, I, I think it's important to realize when we say speaking in tongues, that refers to the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the gifts right. of the Holy Spirit, and therefore it is a gift from God, and therefore it would be good. Okay, when they are speaking, and it's also um, from what I understand. Okay, uh, it's been a while since I've been involved in the charismatic renewal, but it is also. Um, uh, a message of consolation and of hope that is being given to the people of that group, okay? And when there is speaking of tongues, there's also the speaking of, uh, of interpreting tongues in that same group. It's never just the foreign uh, uh, language or the unknown language. Someone has to be interpreted, graced by the Holy Spirit to interpret. Now, in, in the concern would be that the foreign or ancient languages that the demon would use to speak through someone he possessed would be more of destruction, damnation, cursing, and violence. Okay, so I think it's really the difference in, 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 in that. One is one of hope, consolation, and peace, and grace. The other is damnation, hatred, and violence. Christian glossolalia usually is praise language also very yes. often. You can't, you can't praise God uh, unless you have the spirit of God in you. So it's a question which spirit is causing, you know, instigating the speaking. Yes. Okay. Just the stories that they were telling us, 
weren't normal, like, you know, haunting or, um, you know, normal strange activity. It definitely seemed like it was worse than that. And again, the exorcist agreed that something more needed to be done. And I was in communication with the family after that, and the house was received an exorcism, but they were also given a regimen of prayer. And one of the questions was, what, what follow-up do you have after a um, possession? Like, what is a person, what is, what, how are they followed up with? And this particular family was given a regimen of prayer. Um, the members who had not been going to church were, um, well, they were the one person in particular who was being targeted by this thing. Um, was told that he should really um, go to confession regularly, pray very regularly, and um, change a couple of his habits uh, because they thought that maybe that was inviting some of this. Um, but the family did have to change their lives a little bit. They had to change the way that they were interacting with one another and, and their prayer life. It was interesting when we went, uh, it was a very nice evening. We were, we were sitting at table. Uh, they ordered Chinese food, which is always a winner. Um, and um, but when it came time to um, bless the house, when I went into what would be the kitchen, and also kind of a, a like a mother-daughter apartment, although it wasn't um, for the grandmother, it was uh, for um, the uh, son and his wife and child. Um, there was definitely a coldness in the entire place. And I could feel kind of, you know, that sense of, you know, the goosebumps going up and down. So we were, I was blessing it and praying and everything. And as we walked out, I mean, it was something out of the Hounds of the Baskerville because there was this mist on the whole street. And I was just looking. And I said to Jen, I said, Let's get in the car again. <laughs> so I mean, it really, it really, it really, but although we did, I did bless the whole neighborhood and called upon um, our Lord and the angels and the saints to protect the people of, of this neighborhood. Um, we reported it to the bishop. The bishop contacted uh, one of his uh, uh, so, uh, sources. Uh, who's not a priest in our diocese, so uh, it's important to realize no priest in the Diocese of Trenton has permission to do any serious exorcisms. Um, and, uh, and then we just, um, uh, and as Jen shared, you know, there was uh, some positive results. But that uh, was um, the closest, at least I was involved in. Uh, okay. Oh, I think we'll do two more, just because I want to make sure that we can settle up and you know not keep these guys forever. Um, how do you obtain a demon's name when you need to address it by name? Would it tell you? And if so, why would it do that? <laughs> That's a good question. I, it's important to realize that, um, in fact, it was on the news a couple of years ago. Uh, there is a school for exorcists now in Rome. Uh, it, no. <laughs> and uh, it is, um, and, and in fact, I just found out because one of our priests is going for the week session. They do have a week uh, workshop. Uh, but, um, Can I go? No. <laughs> Anyway, um, and, and so it, it's important to realize that in, in the readings I, I, have, I have done, um, the exorcist is told to demand in the name of Jesus Christ the name of the demon. And the demon has to give the name. The demon cannot not give the name. Okay, now, he doesn't give it willingly. There is that tension and as... Um, one source says, sometimes an exorcist can take days, weeks, months, even years. It's not like, you know, take two aspirins, call me in the morning and you'll be fine. So this, this is very serious, but the demon has to, because remember, everything the exorcist is doing is doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, every knee must bend, both above, on, and below the earth. Also, um, 
the uh, prayers that the exorcist uses. Um, in the Catholic tradition, of course, is the uh, Lord's Prayer, the Hail Mary, and then the Athanasian Creed, which is a very long creed that was evolved, that was developed in response to various heresies that denied the, uh, the divinity of Jesus. And these are the prayers that uh, an exorcist would use. So um, the demon does end up giving his name because, and even in scripture, uh, the demons rec recognized Jesus and then were identified by, you know, identified themselves. And we believe that uh, this happens in the, uh, in the rite of exorcism. Skateboarding's on the list now, too. Yes. Monsignor just said, you know, 
Uh, there, there, there is so much real darkness in our lives that does not come from demons or from Satan, but from things that we do to ourselves or just our own feelings of loss and alienation. And a lot of times we know when other people are going through that. Somebody loses a loved one. Somebody loses a job. This is the darkness that has always been us. And if you are not in that darkness, wonderful God bless you. Share those blessings with the same Something I was going to still give. Go ahead, John. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so my, my undergraduate training was in uh, anthropology of religion. And one of the things that we talk about when we talk about oracles in the broader sense, whether those are tarot cards or runes or the I Ching, or any other system of divination is that they have evolved in whatever human construct they, they're couched in to cause people to reflect on themselves. So if you cast the sticks for I Ching or you turn over the runes or you flip the cards, they give you a message and the message that it carries is interpreted by you. And so it causes you to think more deeply about the circumstances of your own life. And if your life is one of darkness, it can lead you down a very dark path. And if your life is one of reflection, introspection, any of those things, it can cause you to ask bigger questions about a larger world. And if you are one who has a strong faith, it can lead you to faith in places where you did not see a light shining. The oracles teach us things about ourselves. They don't teach us things about the world outside of ourselves necessarily. And all I was gonna say is once you, if you're doing stuff, you know, like tarot cards or whatever, to try to find an authority to give you some direction instead of looking to God for direction, it, it really, you know, comes down to your disposition and what you are um, looking for. So if you start having something else make decisions for you, or something else, you know, guide you down, you know, whatever, the path for your future, instead of your introspection or uh, your prayer life, you know, looking for God to direct you, it's easier to go through a door than a wall. And if you're opening yourselves up to, you know, allowing something else to take the place of where God should be, then you're in dangerous territory no matter what that thing is, whether it's an addiction or depression or tarot cards or whatever. Um, we always have to be centering ourselves on God. And if we're doing it on, you know, centering ourselves on any other thing, we're opening ourselves up, period. It's also important to realize Many times we don't see the hand of God in our lives until we've lived our lives. It's like when we turn around and we see where we've been and where all of a sudden we realize that person who stepped into our lives at that particular point, yeah, that's a great person, but that was the hand of God. Those moments that we made the decision to maybe turn left and not right, that was God just leading us in that direction. And that challenges us to stay open to it. Not to wait until God says, okay, go this way, but to be open and to be open to our, each other that are struggling with, this, uh, with, with issues of life. And, and um, you know, it, I, I, remember, I remember we had a tragedy in my first parish and uh, uh, a, a young woman came to the uh, rectory to get a mass party. And she said to me, she said, Father, she said, I want to do more. Uh, what can I do? You know, I mean, the Mass is important, but I want to do more. How can I help? And, and I offer this as, as a key thing, because everybody says, call me if you need anything, right? We all say, call me if you need. How many calls did you get? Okay. I said, get one of those throwaway pants, a little sauce on the bottom, ziti, Cheese, <laughs> bake it in the oven. Then, when it's ready and nice and hot, you go to the house. Okay? And when they say, oh, thank you, say, no, 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 it's hot. And you just work your way into the house. <laughs> okay? And you put it down, and then you look around. Are there dishes in the sink that need to be washed? Are there things that need to be taken care of as the family gathers around the table, as they're trying to figure out? And you just do that peripheral um, work that allows people to know someone is taking care of them at a very painful moment in their lives. 
and then you'll be there when the time comes. Okay? And that ziti with tomato sauce, even if you have to use a jar, it's all right. <laughs> Just use a lot of the cheese. Okay. And then, but it's about this thing. Okay. But it's a winner. Whatever. So um, I, just a quick show of hands. Who plans on coming next week so we can, you know, figure out the room? Yeah, I'm going to be here. Okay. All right. So a lot of people. Okay. Well, thank you. What's that? Oh, hey. I'm.